بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله to proceed my dearest brothers and sisters in Islam I greet you with the warmest Islamic greetings of peace السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إخوان and أخوات brothers and sisters because this is a very important topic I ask you for us to create an intimate environment Please come a bit closer insha'Allah Because this topic is dear to my heart And insha'Allah will become dear to your hearts too Before I get into the topic I want to give you some preliminary notes And these notes are I'm not qualified to speak about the subject Also These notes have been taken primar- primarily from An amazing course that Sheikh Haytham Al-Hadad Delivered a few months ago, a few months ago Called Souls Musk and it's about sincerity. So I thought from brother to brother that I'll give myself some nasiha and yourself also. As we know, the deen is a deen nasiha according to the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, that the deen is sincerity and we give each other sincere advice, inshallah. Because we know that we have to give this advice because it defines who we are. Because as Muslims... We want to be not only a Muslim but a mu'min. We want to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one way of doing that is by loving for others what we love for ourselves. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَا يُؤْمِنُوا أَحَدَكُمْ حَتَّى يُحِبَّ لِيَخِهِ مَا يُحِبَّ لِنَفْسِهِ You won't truly believe unless you love for others what you love for yourself. So if I love this advice and I think it's good for me, then I should love it for my fellow brothers as well, inshaAllah. And primarily the understanding of this hadith is things concerning religious matters. So, I want to paint a mental picture before we get into the discussion. And the mental picture is as follows. Imagine every single one of you from today, you leave this conference and you start praying not only five times a day, but all of your sunnah prayers. You start fasting nearly every day. You fast one day, you don't fast another day. You pray tahajjud every night. You do your dhikr. You feed the poor. You spread the salam. You give your brothers gifts. You smile. You remove obstacles from the road. You engage in charity, sadaqah. You pay your zakat. You fast the month of Ramadan. You do everything possible. You strive in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You get involved in the da'wah. You become a da'i. You call people to Allah. Wudu'u ila sabili rabbik. Call to the way of your Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You facilitate the mercy and the guidance of thousands. You have 2,000 shahadas. You get married again. You have two wives. You have four wives. Alhamdulillah. You have 20 children. Every single one of those children are women. They're girls. And you bring them up, you educate them and they're righteous. We know the hadith. If you have three, two, even one daughter, you educate her. And she's righteous. Then you go to paradise. You adopt orphans. You feed them. SubhanAllah, you are a wonder Muslim. You take over the world. You become Khalifa. And then you go on the day of judgment and Allah throws you to hell. You're in Jahannam. Burning forever, ikhwan and akhawat. Even though you did all of these good deeds. And what is hell? What is Jahannam? Eternity. What is eternity? And think about eternity. Imagine the ocean. And you're standing on a very small island. And the ocean is so vast that you can't see any land in any direction, in any part of the horizon. And you have a teaspoon. And you take the teaspoon, you dip into the ocean, and you empty it onto your island. But every time you could do that, it takes you a thousand years. So one thousand years, you dip into the ocean with your teaspoon, you empty it. Then let's wait another thousand years. Dip your teaspoon into the ocean, then empty out. Then wait another thousand years. This is eternity. This essentially is eternity. 
So although you did all of these good deeds, you're going to hell. Why? Who knows why? Yes, brother. Jazakallah, here, brother. It's because we do not do these deeds solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this shows the, prim- prim- the primary importance, the immense significance of dealing with our hearts. And it is something that many of the ulama said, this is something we should learn before we learn fiqh. Some ulama say this, even some ulama say before you learn the other branches of aqidah, because it's the basis of aqidah. If you don't have ikhlas, sincerity in what you are saying, in your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the truth, truth of Islam, then you don't have Islam. This is one of the conditions of the shahada, which is ikhlas. So ikhwan akhawat, I really want to just go through some notes so we really learn from each other. I don't want this to be another lecture, sermon. I think we should really gain some very useful lessons today. And wallahi, at the end of the today, I want everybody to go home with practical strategies and steps on how to improve the ikhlas. Okay? Let, uh, let me promise that to you, inshallah, that we'll at least discuss some practical steps and strategies to improve our ikhlas. Such an important topic. So before we do this, let's discuss where is ikhlas, where does it lie? Is it in the brain, is it in the liver, is it in your toe? Essentially ikhlas is in the qalb, in the heart. And according to the ulama, ikhwan and akhawat, the qalb, the heart, obviously comes from a term which means to waver, it's always wavering. The heart essentially is the spiritual being, and it is centered in the physical heart, as per the hadith, the famous hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa when he pointed to his heart, when he was talking about the location of taqwa, God consciousness, the mindfulness, awareness, the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And essentially, if we think about this ikhwan and akhawat, a key feature of a righteous heart is that it's in a constant state of yearning with regards to yearning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The yearning of the love and mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know al Ghazali the 11th century theologian and scholar, he mentioned in his books about the heart, and he said essentially the heart is the king and the limbs are the soldiers. So if you think about the analogy here, that the heart is the locus, it's the central point with regards to the actions, it's the basis of the actions, because we know that we, the, the actions themselves are indication of our own intentions of what's going in our heart. So sometimes you see, if someone's always doing bad, is there something wrong with their heart? It's a symptom of an underlying cause. And this reflects the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which you, you can find in Bukhari and Muslim. When the Prophet ﷺ said, in the body there is a morsel of, of flesh, if it is sound, the whole body is sound, if it's corrupt, the whole body is corrupt. And from this perspective, some of the ulama, they said there are three types of hearts. There is the sound heart, as mentioned in the Qur'an. The sick heart, also mentioned in the Qur'an. And a dead heart. Now let's summarize what these are. A sound heart, essentially, according to the ulama, is it's free from desires and defects. From the blemishes of sin and the blemishes of our own nafs and desires. A sick heart, ikhwan and akhawat, is a heart that knows its Lord, knows its Rabb, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to a certain degree, but it suffers from lapses. I think maybe the majority of us are in the second category. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us have a sound heart. Because Allah says in the Quran that no one's going to be safe on the day unless we have a sound heart. And also there is the dead heart, which essentially this heart doesn't know its Lord at all. And from this, we must understand what are the actions of the heart. Now according to the ulama, the actions of the heart are not just mere whispering. It's not just basically fleeting thoughts, okay? Because we know various narrations when the sahaba, may Allah be pleased with them, went to the Prophet wasallam and said, you know, I have some fleeting thoughts in my mind or in my heart, that if I were to utter them, I'd rather be thrown off a cliff. And the Prophet wasallam said, this is a sign of iman. Just ignore them. They're like passing clouds. Don't attach yourself to them. The whisperings of shaitan. Okay, this is not 
an action of the heart per se. And this is a useful advice, especially amongst the youth who suffer from, from whispering, waswas. Especially when it comes to wudu, where I was in the car earlier, we were driving up here, and one brother called us and he was saying, I don't know if I did three rakats, two rakats, I don't know if I have wudu, I don't know if I lied, or if I have ikhlas in this, I don't know if I prayed. He had all these issues, and we had to discuss them, this is shaitan, ignore it. Shaitan wants you to move away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah always wants you back. You know, don't have this kind of despair. So the fleeting thought is not an action of the heart. The action of the heart essentially is the driving force that essentially has the resolve of action, which we're going to discuss a little bit later. So it's, 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 the, it's, the, it's the key driving force in your heart that has a resolve, a strong resolve to do some action. But some ulama said, we are accountable for this. Because generally we say, you're not accountable for what's in your heart, you're accountable for your deeds. But some ulama, which we're going to discuss, this type of action of the heart, which is a very strong desire, with the impulse of action, with a determination and intention to do some action. This is the action of the heart. And the reason I'm mentioning it now, because we're going to link to something we're going to discuss later. So, sincerity lies in the heart, ikhwan and akhawat. And this is why the ulama said, Shaykh Haytham specifically, may Allah preserve him, he said, never have waswas, never have whispering for your ibadah. Pray. Pray to Allah. Do dhikr. You did wudu, you did wudu. You have a doubt that you think you didn't do wudu? Ignore. It's just a doubt. Doubt doesn't override certainty. It's the general principle in our deen. Have yakin. Have a connection with Allah. Have tranquility and sakina in your ibadah. Okay? However, if there is anything you must be concerned about, be doubtful of, even have whispering and what's what's about, it is your intention. It is your intention. Because it's the basis for everything in the deen. And it's actually the basis of tawheed itself. So we know the Arabic word ikhlas linguistically means doing something for a particular purpose. And it also means to purify something and not to mix anything with it. So this is why there's a difference between sincerity as an English term and al-ikhlas. Because al-ikhlas is, is making something exclusive. Purifying your intention for something specific. Hence, ikhlas from this perspective is to do something purely for the sake of Allah, to gain His reward and prevent oneself from entering Jahannam. So think about this. Ikhlas in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to purely do something for the sake of Allah, to gain His reward and to prevent oneself from entering Jahannam. This is ikhlas. Okay? Now, ikhlas is explained some, by some of the ulama is as follows. And these are some statements of some of our ulama. Number one, to single out Allah with intention in matters of obedience. Number two, purifying actions of impurities. These impurities mean doing some part of the action for somebody else or something other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number three, that your public and private actions are similar. SubhanAllah. It's a very strong ind indication of ikhlas. Why are you doing more actions in public and not and less actions in private? If you're solely seeking the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're doing it solely for the sake of Allah, then they should be equal at least, if not more in private. Number four, that you do not seek other than Allah as a witness for your actions or as a compensator for them. So your reward is only with Allah. Which reminds me of the story between Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu. When Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he basically wanted to compete with Abu Bakr. And we know competition in the deen is a good thing. In the dunya it's a bad thing, let him have the dunya. But in the deen it's a good thing. And there's no negative competition, meaning I don't want you to be good. Rather, to facilitate the increase of good deeds for the sake of Allah. And Umar always had a competition with Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Because Abu Bakr as we know, no one could be him in good deeds. No one could be Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu in good deeds. And Umar said, today is my day. Today is my day. And I believe it was in the battle of Tabuk. Umar gave half his wealth. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, Umar, what have you left for your family? And Umar replies, I have left half my wealth. SubhanAllah, imagine giving half of your wealth. Then Abu Bakr gives money, gives his wealth. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, 
What have you left for your family? And Abu Bakr replies, I have left them with Allah and His Messenger. Another narration, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he wanted to beat again Abu Bakr in good deeds. So what he would do, he would go to a Jewish lady's house to try and clean it. But then, he would always find the Jewish lady's house clean. And he was like, what's going on? Who's cleaning the house? He wanted to do a hidden deed that no one knew. So he hid one day, and guess who was cleaning the house earlier? Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And Abu Bakr was Khalifa at the time. SubhanAllah, imagine David Cameron or Obama cleaning uh, someone's house. SubhanAllah, they probably don't even clean their own toilet, these people, multi-millionaires. So look at the lesson from Abu Bakr. When, like, when I heard this, I felt like crying. First, I laughed. I laughed because sometimes it's so astonishing. You either crumble or you laugh. You know, it's like the human reaction. I was laughing out of almost joy. Can there be human beings like this? In a position of power, of leadership, Leading all of the Muslims. Trying to expand the frontiers of Islam so we could establish peace, mercy and justice to the wider society. Yet he had time to go to a Jewish woman's house and clean her house. Wallah, isn't this amazing? You know the thing about the Sahaba, the more you read about them, and the more you listen about them, the more you love them. Isn't that right? The more stories you find about them, you just love them. But when it comes to like the celebrities, the Sahaba of Shaitan, if you like, the companions of Shaitan, the more you read about them, the more you hate them, right? Even if it's your favorite football player. Remember John Terry? I had respect for him. I thought he was a warrior on the, on the defense. Then you find out more about him, what he's done, apparently what he's done, then you just don't like these guys, isn't it? Yeah? Bakhir, so this is. So this is a very good um, kind of story with regards to the lives of the Sahaba, with regards to ikhlas. So let's continue what the ulama say. Number five, to elim- eliminate creation when dealing with your Lord. So when you're seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not to have any intermediaries, even within your heart, that there is an intermediary, or you're doing it for someone else and for Allah. Okay, it's very, very important. The ulama also say that the non-activity and activity of the slave, of the servant, is for Allah exclusively. So let's summarize the ikhlas. So we, we really understand this ikhwan and akhawat. Ikhlas is the one who makes the ikhlas of his or her religion for Allah only. He seeks the reward of Allah, he wants to prevent himself or herself from entering Jahannam, and seeks to please Allah Azza wa Jal. That the servant makes the action purely for Allah, and does not include anyone else along with Allah in his or her religion. And we see various Quranic verses related to this. For example, in Surah Baqarah verse 139, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, do you argue with us about Allah while He is our Lord and your Lord? For us our deeds and for you are your deeds. And we are sincere in deed and intention to Him. Referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In chapter 4 verse 146, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Except for those who repent, correct themselves, hold fast to Allah, and are sincere in their religion for Allah, for those will be the believers, and Allah is going to give the believers a great reward. So, ikhwan akhawat, we see that ikhlas here is to do something solely for the sake of Allah, to gain His reward, and to remove yourself from the punishment. And we see there is a Quranic obligation for this. As we see in chapter 76, Allah says in the Quran, and they give food in spite of the love for it to, to the needy, the orphan and the captive. Saying, we feed you only for the countenance of Allah. We wish not you reward or gratitude. So this is also a sign and a signification of someone who is doing something solely for the sake of Allah. They don't care if they're praised and they don't care if they're dispraised. It's irrelevant. They are very distinct from that perspective. This is why the Islamic shaksiya, the Islamic character, when they develop, when the, the, the Muslim or the Muslim develops his, his or her ikhlas, they become a very distinct character. They could have friendships that are not based upon benefit. It's not a benefit-oriented friendship like you have in the capitalist liberal West. Because it's based on individualism. What's in it for me? I'm alright Jack. 
You know, I'm his friend because he's cool. I'm his friend because he has money. I'm his friend because he has status. That very shallow friendship, benefit. But we befriend someone for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm your brother for the sake of Allah. I love you for the sake of Allah. So if you spit on me, hate me, I still give you your rights. I'm still kind to you. I'm still compassionate to you. I'm still merciful to you. Regardless of reciprocation. Regardless. And that's the distinct character of a Muslim. But nowadays, unfortunately, what do we do? Someone doesn't speak to us, we don't speak to them back. We won't speak to our brothers for nine months. Even we know if you don't speak to them more than three days, I believe according to the hadith, please correct me, it's like slaughter. Subhanallah. So if you read, and this, this social issue in our community is not a sign of no knowledge, it's a sign of the state of our hearts. It's a sign of ikhlas. Are you loving this brother for the sake of Allah? If that's the case, then your nasiha is going to be different. You're going to be talking to him as if you're talking to your own mother. Not as if you're feeling better about yourself. Ahi, oh, you didn't pray Fajr and Dhuhr. You missed your prayers. Alhamdulillah, I pray. What's wrong with you? Do you see the kind of nasiha here? It's like in psychology, it's called, cognitive, it's called um, it's a Zimbardo theory. It's called Zimbardo's theory of social comparison theory. Sorry, Festinger's social comparison theory. It's a theory where you compare yourself with others just to make yourself feel better because you have low self-esteem and you have issues within yourself. And that's what we do as human beings, isn't it? Sometimes we feel so happy that someone has done a sin because it reminds us that we're not sinning. SubhanAllah, that itself is a sin. So, if we follow the hadith of the Prophet wasallam that said, المؤمنو مِرَاتُ المؤمن, The believer is a mirror of another believer. So if your fellow believer has a blemish and he's your mirror image, what are you going to do? You're not going to wipe the mirror, are you? You're going to check yourself because if he's sinning, you're sinning. So if you have that approach, when you give him nasiha, it will be like giving nasiha to your own mother, wallahi. So this is why we must have that ikhlas and sincerity in our hearts. And this Quranic verse is a strong indication of this. A very famous hadith, which I believe is a hadith Qudsi, it's quite long but it's worth to read out because it's such, every time I read it, wallahi, your hairs should go and end. It's a very powerful hadith concerning ikhlas. And who are we seeking with regards to our deeds? The hadith is as follows. And I believe it's in Sahih Muslim, I believe. The first of people against whom judgment will be pronounced of the day of resurrection will be a man who died as a martyr. Okay? Which we know is the greatest deed. He will be brought and Allah will make known to him his favors and he would recognize them. The Almighty Allah will say, And what did you do about them? He will say, I fought for you until I died a martyr. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, You have lied. You did but fight that it might be said of you, He is courageous. And so it was said. Then he will be ordered to be dragged along on his face until he is cast into the hellfire. Another will be a man who has studied religious knowledge and has taught it and used to recite the Qur'an. He will be brought and Allah will make known to him his favors and he will recognize them. The Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, And what did you do about them? He would say, I studied religious knowledge and I taught it and I recited the Qur'an for your sake only. Allah will say, You have lied. And you did but study religious knowledge that it might be said of you, he is learned. And you recited the Qur'an that it might be said of you, he is a reciter. And so it was said. Then he will be ordered to be dragged along on his face until he is cast into Jahannam, into hellfire. Another will be a man whom Allah had made rich and to whom he had given all kinds of wealth. He will be brought to Allah and he will make known to him his favors and he will recognize them. The Almighty Allah will say, And what did you do about them? He will say, I left no path untrodden in which you like money to be spent without spending in it for your sake, O Allah. He will say, You have lied. You did but do so that it might be said of you, He is open-handed. And so it was said, Then he will be ordered to be dragged along his face into his caste into Jahannam. Subhanallah. This hadith is enough. This hadith is enough for us to understand that the actions themselves are going to be judged by intention and where our heart lies. Who was it for? Was it for the public? Was it for fame? 
And this is even worse for people like us who speak now and then. It's much worse. And we have to bear this in mind because if our deeds are not for the sake of Allah, then these deeds are nothing, zero. No matter what deed you, you, you have done. No matter how high it is on the scales, it doesn't mean anything. If there is no ikhlas behind these deeds, it gives you nothing on the day of judgment. Humiliation. And this is something we all have to realize and always have a conscious effort to really focus. Because remember, ikhlas lies in the heart. The heart is something that wavers. And many of the ulama, especially I believe Sufi al Thawri, he said, the, the thing I'm always scared about is my intention. Because it's always changing. It's always changing. So we have to really, really be focused and take a snapshot of ourselves continuously every day, every hour. And ask ourselves the question, which is the power of questions. And the power of questions is a strategy that Allah has given us. Because from questions, Allah gives us answers. And in themselves, do they not see? That's like a rhetorical question almost. Or making you really think into the inner dimension of the self. Look, within yourself, the physiological and psychological realities. There is something here that's indicating uluhiyah, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with regards to His worship. Rububiyah, with regards to His Lordship. There, there's elements that you can understand from within yourself, your own creation, your own nafs even, your physiology and your psychology that indicate the divine reality, that indicate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah makes us question. أَفَلَا يَنظُرُونَ إِلَى الْإِبْلِي كَيْفَ خُلِقَتْ Have you not seen the cow and how it was created? Question. The power of questions makes us, directs us towards a certain conclusion. And this is the Quranic strategy of making us think and reflect doing tadabbur. Do they not reflect within themselves? Yatafakkirun, Allah says. For those who reflect. So the power of questions are very important. It makes us reflect and it makes us think deeply about our reality. And this is why we have to keep this strategy every day in our lives. To be people of reflection. So we reflect within our hearts. So we know where does my intention lie? Sincerity is very important because we know it's the condition. It's one of the, con- it's one of the two conditions for actions to be accepted. Because we know ikhwan akhawat, any action in the deen, for it to be accepted is based on what? Ikhlas, you're doing it for the sake of Allah, for the, for the reward, or to remove yourself from, for, for, from the punishment, or for all three. And it has to be in line with the? Sunnah, with the sharia. This is why... Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad said about chapter 67 verse 2 when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to test you which of you is best in action. He said this means verily an action that is done sincerely and is not proper prop, and is not proper is not accepted. So let's think about this. Even if you have ikhlas but it's not a proper action it's not accepted. And when it is proper but there is no ikhlas, it is also not accepted. Sincere action is one that is done for the sake of Allah, and is proper, and is in line with the sharia, and it's in accordance, in accordance with the sunnah. So we see from this perspective that we know that actions are accepted if you have ikhlas, and they're in line with Islam. So ikhwan al-Khawad, let's look at some of the fruits of sincerity. First and foremost, the fruits of sincerity are so great, that the rewards of sincerity outstrip the action itself. The rewards of sincerity outstrip the action itself. For example, you could have done an action, for instance, to feed a thousand orphans, but you just managed to feed ten. But you had so much ikhlas in doing it for the sake of Allah, and your intention was pure to feed a thousand, but you couldn't. Allah reward you for your intention. The other fruits of sincerity is that your actions are accepted as we just discussed. A significant aspect of ikhlas, ikhwan akhawat, is that habitual actions are rewarded. Now, this is to the sisters as an example. Akhawat, listen to this carefully. Say you've been making your husband the same curry every Saturday for 30 years. And wallahi, you hate the smell of the curry. It takes time. You have to have sabr. You're sweating and you're upset. Wallahi, for 30 years you can have reward of Allah. If you said, I don't like it, but I'm doing it for your sake, Ya Allah. 
habitual actions, if you turn them as actions for the sake of Allah, they become immensely rewardable. Imagine all the things that you do that become mechanical in your life. Even if it's eating food, ikhwan and akhawat. You eat food because we're animals from that perspective and we will need to feed ourselves to have energy to live. Curry, samosa, pakora, roti, whatever stuff you have. If you're Somali, you have banana with your rice. Anyway, whatever the case may be. Yeah? If it's me, like Greeks, we have moussaka. Yeah? So from this perspective, ikhwan and akhawat, Eating, your own eating, your breakfast could be a reward, could be ibadah. Why? Before you put a morsel of food in your, in your mouth, if you say, Ya Allah, I'm eating this, so I strengthen my body, so I could become a strong servant and a worshipper. Because the Prophet ﷺ did say, that the strong believer is better than the weak one. Which means physical and other aspects of iman as well. Wallahi, if you did that, every single piece of food, and wallahi, many of us eat. I can even tell by looking at you. <laughs> MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Yes or no? We eat. We eat. And alhamdulillah, the barakah and blessing from Allah. But imagine we focus. Wallahi, do this as homework. Please. I beg you for the sake of Allah, do it. One, so I could get the reward. And secondly, so you could really start being a person of ikhlas continuously. Even your habitual actions. You're going to eat tonight. Yes or no? Yes or no? No one fasts in the evening, yeah? Yeah? Alhamdulillah. Before you eat, have in mind Allah. Say, Ya Allah, I know I'm eating and I want to eat because it's an instinct. But Ya Allah, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a snapshot of myself, focusing and saying, Ya Allah, I'm doing it to glorify you. I'm doing it, Ya Allah, to glorify you because I know you have given me this food. All praise due to you. You have given me the rizq for me to, to enable to eat this food and I'm going to use this to strengthen myself for ibadah and to be a strong Muslim for your sake. Wallahi, do this. Put your hand up if you're going to do this today. Please. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. It's amazing, huh? And you do this every day. Say you got 30 years left, 20 years left, 10 years left. Allah knows. But you do it for the years that you have left. You eat it will become an ibadah. Imagine that, bro. Wallahi. Imagine. Imagine, can you just imagine eating, drinking water? That's the power of ikhlas. We know it's a protection from shaitan. We know it prevents riya. It grants us wisdom, it removes regret and anxiety. It gives eternal paradise, forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and reward even if mistaken. Even if mistaken. And we see this in aspects of ishtihad. If you thought it was, it was the right way, and it was an ishtihadi matter, but you're wrong, you still get the reward. As we know, per the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these are the fruits of ikhlas. Let's look at the dangers. Well, first and foremost, it's very simple. You're barred from entering Jannah. You are barred from entering eternal bliss with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hellfire is the recompense, and we discuss what eternity really means in a practical sense. Get a teaspoon, dip into the ocean, throw it away, and wait another thousand years, dip a teaspoon into the ocean, throw what you have away, and continue doing that. SubhanAllah, is the ocean ever going to diminish? Wallahi, that's attorney ikhwan and akhawat. We know actions are rejected, totally. And we lose the reward of actions, and eternal residence in the hellfire will be our abode. So we've understood what ikhlas is. We've seen the fruits of ikhlas. We've seen the dangers of ikhlas. Now let's discuss two elements that are related to ikhlas, which is something that we need to really focus on. And we know this very well, but it's a reminder for all of us. And this is riyah. Doing actions so that people can see them in order to win their praise. This is the scholarly definition of riyah. Doing actions so that people can see them in order to win their praise and admiration, or to gain position and status amongst them, and or, or to obtain any worldly benefit. This is hugely important to understand. Because riya nullifies sincerity, it nullifies ikhlas, ikhwan and akhawat. Hence Allah says in the Quran in chapter 107, So woe to those who pray, but are heedless of their prayer, those who make it to show off their deeds and withhold simple Assistance. 
Also, Allah says in the Quran, Surah Baqarah, verse 264, Oh, you have believed. Do not invalidate your charities with reminders of injury, as, do, as does one who spends his wealth to be seen by the people and does not believe in Allah and the last day. And listen to this example by Allah Azza His example is like of a large smooth stone upon which is dust and is hit by a downpour, downpour of water that leaves it bare. They are unable to keep anything of what they have earned. So Riyā from this perspective demolishes our deeds. Just like the stone that has dust in it and there is a showering of, of rain and there's no dust left, it's gone. You can't obtain anything of what you've earned. This is the danger of including something, something else or someone else such as fame, status in your intention. And some of the ulama, they say, take me as a speaker. I'm giving you a talk. And inshallah, it was for the sake of Allah. Okay? May Allah make us sincere. And I saw the reaction of a brother. The reaction of a brother. He's like, subhanAllah. From his reaction, I changed my style. I increased my voice. And I do it because I know I'm getting some recognition. That is riya as well. And the ulama say, I get rewarded up to that point, but anything new I've added into my action, I don't get no reward. But if at, towards the end of the talk, I do it just for the sake of your pleasure and your reaction, then that could even be shirk. Subhanallah. Do you see how nuanced it is, ikhwan and akhawat? This is why never have waswas of your ibadah, but have waswas for your intentions. Think about them, be conscious of them continuously. And this makes a person very conscious. He, he becomes a mindful person. Everything he or she does is, is in a state of mindfulness. Wallahi, that's a very distinct position to be in. Even when you're washing dishes, ikhwan akhawat, you're bored, you're tired, your hands may be cracking. Like my mom's hands, they crack because she's allergic to, to London water. This, because there's a lot of chemicals in water, they crack. But she washes it. If she was Muslim, may Allah guide her. And she said, I'm doing it for your sake, Ya Allah. That habitual action could be immense reward for her. Even brothers, massage your wife's feet. When was the last time you massaged your wife's feet? Put your hand up. Has anyone massaged the wife's feet before? Has anyone? If you put your hand up, then you're, you're, you're encouraging people to good, do good deeds. Have that ikhlas. MashaAllah. May Allah bless you. May Allah bless you, Ya Shaykh. Wallahi I think it's amazing. But I know many of us we don't. Typical, typical Kashmiris, huh? Feet? Women don't have feet. Yeah? <laughs> Wallahi. Ikhwan al massage your wife's feet. Do it for the sake of Allah tonight. Put your hand up. Another action. Homework. Who's going to massage the wife's feet? Put your hand up. You don't have a wife, Yashir? I have You have a wife? But I've never done it. Well, do it today. I can't. Why not? I don't know. You can. Wallahi, Yashir, you can. Might be, but I'm... I'll never try, you know. Try, just right here. Say, wife, I love you for the sake of Allah. I've never done this before. I heard a talk today. Some little boy was giving me a talk. And he said some few good things, maybe. And he told me to massage your feet for the sake of Allah so I get reward. And because it would encourage me to love you more. She'd be like, well, she'd probably do things to you that you never imagine. Wallahi adhim, yeah? She'd be like, here, have your best curry today, yeah? Do you see my point? Do it. Does it work, Isha? Do you get the respect of your wife? Of course you do. She loves you more, yes or no? Yeah. Wallahi, what a humbling experience of massaging the feet of your wife. Wallahi. What about your mother? Even more important, paradise is under the feet of your mother. Do it. See, ikhwan akhawat, in order for us to transform and change, you don't aspire. Don't say, I'm going to change, I intend to change. Change never works that way. Change is when you be. You be, you do, and you become. This is the psychology of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Cry in the last third of the night. If you can't cry, pretend. And when you keep on doing it, it will become part of you, then you'll have sincerity in it. You be, you do, and you become. Don't, don't think, do it. Like Shaykh Adam says, even if you think you don't have ikhlas, pretend to have ikhlas. Do the deed anyway. And then ikhlas, you, know, you press a button, now have ikhlas. Ya Allah, I'm doing it for your sake, and that's it, you done it for his sake. No, words are not ikhlas, it's where your heart lies. And Shaykh Hazim makes a beautiful point. Don't stop the deeds, don't let shaitan win and say, Ah, oh, I'm not sincere, so I'm not going to do the deed. Do it! And keep on having Allah in mind. Do it and continue it, and be continuous. 
So you be, you do, you become. So even if you think there's no class in it, you're really hesitant, you know, we've got that pride, just do it, do it, khalas, do it. And then once you keep on doing it, you do it, then you become, it will become part of you. Honestly. So, this also refers to a hadith of the Prophet wasallam, related by Ibn Majah, and the hadith is Hassan. The Prophet wasallam, he talked about Riya, and he said, Shall I not inform you of what I fear for you more than the Dajjal? It is hidden shirk. It is when a man stands up for prayer, then beautifies his prayer for another to look at it. So, we should be careful of this and always have Allah in mind when we're doing any action and not to have riya and not to have any aspects of our intention being spoiled by doing things for fame or other people. Connected to riya is sum'ah. This is the same as riya, but instead of the shirk occurring via the senses of the sight, it is through the hearing. So it's very similar. Some of the ulama said it's the same as, as riya, but in a different form. And this form in, in terms of hearing. It's where you want people to know about your good deeds. There's a famous story from the Salaf, I believe. Someone had a very amazing recitation. And the brothers were saying, Oh, mashallah, his, uh, his recitation is amazing. And then the person who's reciting turns around and says, And I was fasting today as well. <laughs> now, this is Suma. It's basically when you, you, you may even have done the deed for the sake of Allah. But after you want people to know about it. And this is why in Bukhari, there's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says, He who commits sum'ah, Allah will do that with him. And he who commits riya, Allah will do that with him. Essentially, Allah will forget him. Because you included someone else in the deed that you're supposed to do for the sake of Allah. Be very careful, ikhwan khawat. Now let's hear some stories from the early generations concerning ikhlas. Suhail rahimullah was asked, radiallahu anhu was asked, what is the thing most difficult for the nafs? Actually it was Suhail, not Sufi Nathari, I apologize. He replied to have ikhlas, especially when the soul is not disposed towards it. So they, the salaf, the best people of our generation, said that ikhlas was the hardest thing. So imagine how we should be feeling about our own intention and our ikhlas. Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad, he said, abandoning action for the sake of people is to seek the admiration. To do an action for the sake of people is to commit shirk. Indeed, ikhlas is when Allah saves you from both of these states. So listen, listen to some tales of sincerity which really, uh, really makes us think about ikhlas, ikhwan and akhawat. Dawud ibn Hind, he fasted for 40 years and even his family did not know. He would take his lunch from them but he would give it away as charity. And then he would return at night and eat with his family. SubhanAllah, he would fast for 40 years and his, even his family did not know. Wallahi, many of us, our wives know when we're fasting. Our wives when we're reading, know when we're reading Quran. Our wives know when we're doing tahajjud. Our wives know these things. But look at this ibadah that no one knew, not even his, even his family. Now listen to this, Ikhwan Akhawat. Al-Mawardi, he wrote books on fiqh and tafsir, but significantly he was known for siyasa, for political aspects in the deen. He wrote, Ahkam al sultaniyah The Ahkam of the Sultan, of the Khilafah. And he wrote many of these works. He's very famous Ikhwan Akhawat for these works. But wallahi, he was not known for any of them during his lifetime. He was not known for any of them during his lifetime. Think about this Ikhwan Akhawat. Because when he died, he told his close companion that he hid some books that he wrote and to publish them after his death. Because he was fearful of his sincerity. Wallahi, when I heard this, I was almost in tears. Just, just, just reflect on this story. Also, it was reported that Abi Layl prayed at night. If someone entered his house, he would lie down in his bed as if he was sleeping. So, Ikhwan Akhawat, think about these stories and reflect on our ikhlas. So let's quickly in the last five minutes, discuss the indicators of sincerity 
the indicators of insincerity and how we can develop ikhlas, the strategies we can use. So the ind- indicators of insincerity are as follows. They dislike being famous. When Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he gave a speech to the, to the Ansar at the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa which I believe was on a Monday. He gave them a speech and said, I want Umar to be the leader. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he loved the speech because he was preparing his own speech. But he said, Wallahi Umar, based on the pro- impromptu speech without preparation was better than mine. But I disagreed with the last statement, which was that I should be the leader. He said, Wallahi, I would rather my head to be cut off than me to lead Abu Bakr. And all of the Salaf and the pious criticisms, they moved away from leadership and being famous. So they dislike being famous. They dislike praise. They had the intense desire to work for the sake of the deen. They wanted to be proactive and seek reward. They have patience and forbearance. They strive to do deeds in secret. They strive to perfect the deeds in secret. And their hidden actions are greater than the public ones. This are, these are indicators of sincerity. The indicators of insincerity is wanting to be known and wanting to be famous. Liking praise. Striving to show off one's deeds. Concentration on perfecting deeds in public only. And have hardly having any hidden deeds. So to the most important point, Ikhwan and Akhawat, let's now really take home this message on how to develop our sincerity. Wallahi, if you haven't focused for the past few minutes, focus now. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimullah, which I... The more I read about Ibn Taymiyyah, the more I respect him as a polymath. Wallahi, this human being was phenomenal, especially in the works of Islamic thought. There is a book that was recommended by a senior student of knowledge who sits at the feet of senior ulama in Mecca who are experts on Ibn Taymiyyah. And it's a book in English. It's published by Brill and it's written by John Hoover. And John Hoover has so much respect for him, he calls him the Sheikh. And this book is called Ibn Taymiyyah's Theodicy of Perpetual Optimism. Forget the grand words, it's a very simple book. And it's amazing on Ibn Taymiyyah's view on creation, on the purpose of life, problem of evil, and amazing stuff. So this Sheikh is amazing. And he, and listen to this advice. He said, do one deed every day that no one will know about. Ever. And this doesn't include the prayers because they know you pray, you're a Muslim. Do a deed every day that no one knows about apart from you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even you will forget. Again, put your hand up. Would you do a deed every day? Try. Have the intention to do a deed every day that you do for the sake of Allah that no one knows about. Alhamdulillah. Second, it's very important. Seek the help from Allah as a wajal. Make dua. Say, Allah, make me sincere. Make this dua. Without the help of Allah, we are nothing. Be absorbed in thinking about the akhirah. Because no, without ikhlas, your akhirah is doomed. Avoid seeking to be known. Avoid seeking to be known. Think about death. Every soul is going to taste death. Think about death continuously. Because wallahi, when you think about death, you become sincere very easily. And an indication of this is, if you've ever done martial arts before boxing, and you've had a sparring match, or you've been beaten up badly, you're so humble. You're slightly closer to death than others. You're so sincere. It's happened to me. It's happened to me when I've been really beaten and tired in a boxing match or something, when I used to do boxing. I'm like, yeah man, I was so wrong, please forgive me, akhi, yeah. Do you see my point? But if I wasn't in that state, I'd have a bit more of an ego. You're beaten, isn't it? Sometimes a good beating is good, wallahi man. Some of us need it, yeah? Not that I recommend us to beat each other up, but you know, amongst brothers, a light little slap here and there may do us some good, you know? To wake us up, wallahi, sometimes we need this. We, we must increase the praise of Allah and decrease the praise of creation to understand that behind everything is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All thanks and all praise are due and belong to Allah. If we really acknowledge this from a psychological perspective, then it will increase our ikhlas because we know everything is from Allah anyway. We must be worried about the acceptance of our deeds. Always be worried about them. And that's a good indication of ikhlas and it helps increase our ikhlas. Evaluate yourself regularly, ikhwan akhawat. Always take a snapshot of yourself and say, Who is this for? Ya Allah, who is this for? I want it to be for your sake. Have that driving force in your heart to do it for the sake of Allah. 
And remember, ikhwan akhawat, that you'll be known on the day of resurrection for what you did. You'll be known. You don't have to be known in the dunya. You'll be known in the akhir. And make your aim Allah. Everyone has an aim and make your aim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the wells. As the hadith says, whoever has the hereafter as his main concern, Allah will bring together all of his, his, his affairs. He will fill his heart with richness and contentment and this world will come to him in spite of it. Whoever has this world as his main concern, Allah will place all his matters in disarray, place poverty before his eyes and he will have nothing of this world except what was already predestined for him. So to end ikhwan akhawat, let's respond to Allah's call of coming closer to him, the call of everything that is good and everything that is good is done with ikhlas. Because if we do that, then Allah will give us life. As Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, stajibu lillahi wa li rasuli, idha da'akum lima yuhiyikum. O you who believe, respond to the call of Allah and His Messenger, to that which gives you life. Imam Bukhari says, the response here is to respond all that is good. And according to Ibn Kathir, all that is good is Islam itself. And any deeds within Islam, we must have ikhlas. So inshallah, this was a very nice reminder for the brothers and the sisters. Please, you promised to do three homeworks. Massage the feet of your mother or your wife. If you, you're women, massage the feet of your husband or your mother, or even your, your father. Make all your habitual deeds into deeds of ibadah, even your food tonight. You're doing it for the sake of Allah to strengthen yourself so you could have more ibadah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Follow the strategies. Do a deed every day that no one knows, excluding the prayers. For the sake of Allah that no one knows, and you even forget. And just do it solely for His sake. And follow the strategies of developing your ikhlas, by be always being aware of your akhirah, understanding that without your class you have nothing, and all the strategies we just discussed, and develop some more of your own. Ikhwan akhawat, be people of ikhlas. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides you, and loves you, and forgives you, and forgives all of us. Make dua for the oppressed of our ummah. Make dua for me. Make dua for my parents that they are guided to Islam. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love all of you, and grant you jannah for those. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت وصلى الله كتب إليك وسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. The uncle asked the question, why, why in us following the actions of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم do we find them a taboo? For example, even maybe the clothes or the beard or wearing miswak or the sunnah prayers or you're feeding the poor or dealing with people nicely or even the things that even society see as something that's wrong like massage the feet of your wives or polygamy for instance yeah, I know it's a popular subject amongst you guys yeah alhamdulillah <laughs> or whatever they, these are stigmatized taboo subjects I don't know the answer yeah I'm not a sheikh or a mufti yeah I'm just a little boy I'm miskeen but I give you my 10 pence and my 10 pence on this is this is that we have suffered from an inferiority complex because we lack a little bit of ikhlas and yakin, yakin in the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what He has given us is good for us Wallahi, if you take the Sahaba the small village the villages of Mecca and Medina they had nothing and they took over the world one third of the world how on earth did they do this? they had no weapons they had no technology they had no academia it was just them and Tawheed because they knew what Tawheed meant. It wasn't the three categories, Uluhiyya, Rububiyya, etc. Yes, we know that from an academic perspective, but it was here in the heart. Because when Allah says and His Messenger say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, what does that mean? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. It's not a statement we say as out of frustration when we spill tea on the floor. Many of us say that. What have you done? La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. You never listen. Yeah, we use that almost as an expletive to replace the swear words. But what does it mean, Ikhwan Akhawat? It means there is no true power except the power of Allah. This means that anything in creation intrinsically has no true power. Therefore you can't blame them for anything and they don't have any power and they can't be your obstacle because Allah only uses them as a tool to bring about His will and His power. This is so fundamental in the science of Tawheed, in the affirming the oneness of Allah Azawajal. This is why the Sahaba, they could take over the world, not, be, not fear anybody. Because they knew whatever happens is because of Allah's will and power, not because of Him. He has no truth. I'm not going to fear Him. He's nothing. I'm nothing. Do you see? And this is, this is so important for us to understand. It would really empower us to have a new realm of possibility to achieve what we can achieve. This is why Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, what did he do? 
Before leading the army, he would make dua to Allah so much as if he needed no one else but Allah. He was finished. And when he was fighting on the battlefield, what did he do? What did he do? It's as if he needed no one else but himself. This is the Muslim. Wallahi, we fear the things that should not be feared. And we become victims. Wallahi, uncle, we become victims. The language of victimhood is a disempowering language. You tell me when the Prophet ﷺ blamed anyone else for his situation. Tell me, when did he blame others, the Zionist, Fox News, BBC? When did he blame these people? Ikhwan al wake up. We have even political organizations amongst the Ummah. We always want to be the victims. Oh, we're oppressed. Oh, we're this, oh, we're that. We, we become women with beards, wallahi. We're women with beards. Yes, we are oppressed, we agree. But we don't have the mentality of the oppressed. Because we have Allah. Allah is our helper. Allah is our friend. We have Allah, they don't have Allah. We have Tawheed, they don't have Tawheed. Every situation is an opportunity for reward and success. And we should never have the victim of mentality. Once you have the victim of mentality, what do you do? You give power to the oppressor. He is the only one that is able to change your situation. That is the science of victimhood. Oh, I can't, I can't change. Look at me, I'm, I'm a victim. Wallahi, the Sahab were never like this even when they were losing in battle sometimes. It's because they understood reality, Ikhwan and Akhawat. They understood reality. So I think it's Yaqeen, it's understanding Tawheed, what it really means in the heart. And by the way, atheists are mushriks. According to Dr. Jafar Idris, and he makes an amazing point because they attribute power to creation. Wallahi, interesting point, huh? The all-powerful, the attribute, the attribute to creation. Because the naturalists, which in the classical sciences they were called the Dahriyas, the Dahriya, which now are known as communists. The Dahriya, they were naturalists thinking that the whole world is a self-contained system and it only has power. So when you fear, you're like an atheist. Wallahi! It's like you don't believe in Allah. Because you think that this creation has intrinsic power. This is the aqidah of a naturalist, of the Dahriya. This is the aqidah of the atheist. But we believe in Allah. So if, when we reaffirm this yaqeen, wallahi, it will change your life. Inshallah. And you see this in the lives of the Sahaba. 90 years after the death of Rasulullah, where were we? Who knows where Multan is? Pakistan. We're in Multan, we're in Spain. Subhan, 90 years after the death of the Prophet And it was only then that we decided to fix the masjid, by the way. It was still dripping of water. So that tells you how important buildings are in Islam. Not very important. Okay. Question. Can I take this question, Sheikh? Is that, is that okay, Uncle? Sorry. So I, I went off a little bit of a rant. I do apologize. I, I get like that sometimes. This is the Greek in me, yeah? No excuse, though. Um, question. If we are reading the Quran or some other Islamic book and feel like sharing the verses or lessons from other book on Facebook, sometimes I think I may be sharing it like telling the world, this is what I'm reading, but I think I'm sharing because I want to share the knowledge. How to keep the intention correct when sharing knowledge in public? Ikhlas and Facebook likes and Islamic statuses, we don't want to be famous. That's a very good point. Actually, after the course I did with Sheikh Haytham, I nearly stopped my Twitter account, my Facebook account, I nearly stopped giving talks, I nearly stopped writing, I nearly stopped doing everything. I still nearly stopped doing the da'wah, you know that? And but that was shaitan, obviously, yeah? Making you stop doing good deeds, yeah? But it was such a powerful course, I walked out of the course thinking, Wallahi, none of my deeds have been accepted. Honestly. I think, Sister Ukhti, the best thing to do here is every time you do this action, have Allah in your mind. Don't make it mechanical. Every time you do it, you say, Allah, I'm doing this to glorify you. Don't allow shaitan to whisper thinking, oh look, you're getting famous, people are liking your status updates, whatever the case may be. If you fear so much, then you could, I think, disable your status likes and just put the, the status up there in the first place. And if there is a time when you think that you're doing it for riya or something, then don't do it for that hour. Wait till the next day. And make dua to Allah and say, Ya Allah, help me spread your knowledge. And this is a good tool, and Facebook can be a good tool to spread knowledge. It's a public tool. And make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this. And follow the strategies we mentioned. Think about your akhirah. Is this deed going to make any impact to my akhirah? No, it's not if I do it for other people. 
Is it shirk? It could lead to shirk. Subhanallah. If all you need to do is remind yourself. فذكر. Allah says, and remind the believers. For reminding is good for them. Keep on reminding yourself. Wallahi, if you have that in your mind, even write the strategies down. Every time you have this whispering of this kind of wrong inclination, pick up that paper and say, Oh, subhanAllah, I remember the strategies. Yes, subhanAllah, there's hellfire for me. Yes, this, I want to move away from this. Ya Allah, I'm doing it for you for your sake. Okay? So that's probably the only thing I could give you, inshaAllah.